welcome to the podcast Byzantium and Friends. I am Anthony, your host. Imagine if the magnificent capital of your ancient, wealthy, and civilized state lay on the edge of a sea. On the other end of that sea, there was a vast set of plains, a steppe whose extent you did not know. You had no idea how far they extended into the north and east. And it was inhabited by countless changing tribes that you imagined as mostly nomadic, kind of the antithesis of your own cultural values, right? So instead of being uh, sedentary, agricultural, sort of urban-based civilization like yours, they were nomadic horsemen who ranged over the plains and might occasionally burst into the settled, civilized world of cities that was Uh, near you, or in fact, your own world. This would be a rather unsettling situation, um, and it was of perennial concern to the authorities in Constantinople for a thousand years, from the Huns in the late 4th century to the Mongols in the 13th and 14th. That world was dominated by unpredictable, vast powers that could just erupt out of the steppe and uh, devastate cities um, all across in the Balkans and Eastern Europe, sometimes even into Central Europe and up to the walls of Constantinople itself. And there wasn't a whole lot that you could do to control or manipulate that world. Now, Romans had a standard ethnographic category for understanding that world, which they had inherited from the ancient Greeks, and this was the category of the Scythians, classically described by Herodotus um, in uh, his book on on the Scythians. This is uh, book two of his histories. And this model of the rapidly moving nomadic armies and populations on the move remained dominant in the imagination of East Romans for the whole millennium in that they called most people who lived in that area uh, Scythians. Now, they understood that they weren't all the same people, right? Like sort of as an ethnic group, they weren't all the same Scythians as the ones described by Herodotus. And even Herodotus knew that the Scythians were divided into many different groups. But as a kind of ethnographic archetype, the Scythian remained the dominant image for people who lived north of the Black Sea. In fact, the historian Procopius in the 6th century explains that Scythian was a generic term that he said we use for anybody living there, even though they're very different groups and they differ from each other in in, in many important ways. And sometimes we have more specialized names for this group and that group. Huns, Kutrigurs, Utrigurs, later uh, Kumans, Pechenegs, and so forth. And if anybody had any doubts that that archetype uh, was perhaps becoming um, outdated, the Mongols came along in the 3rd century and confirmed that it you know, was exactly the way Herodotus had described them. However, there were a number of groups during the millennium who emerged from that part of the world and whom the Romans called Scythians, who just didn't meet the ethnographic profile of the ancient Scythians, the kind of Hun or Mongol model. Among them were the Goths, Uh, who were called Scythians, but the model just didn't work for them that well. And another group uh, is the one that we will be talking about today, and these are, uh, in this part of the world, the Rus. These were, let us say, a part of uh, Scandinavian expansion um, in, in, in this period, but into the east. We are more familiar with Scandinavian expansion into the West, which yielded the phenomenon of the Vikings, who made settlements uh, all around from you know, uh, from Iceland to uh, England and and France, giving Norman yielding Normandy, for example. And in the East, they tended to produce the various uh, Varangian Rus principalities, uh, eventually Kiev and so forth. Now, in Western medieval Europe. The arrival of the Vikings, the Northmen, produced a new kind of model. Vikings pressed upon the Western European imagination with such uh, vivid clarity and distinctive culture and behavior uh, 
but it resulted in a new kind of ethnographic type that Western Europeans were familiar with and they codified and we still talk about. This didn't really happen in the East, so the East Romans did not develop a new ethnographic category for this new type of barbarian arrival. Um, these are people who were certainly not nomadic cavalry raiders, uh, but were more engaged in uh, long-distance trade and long-distance raids, but usually through their ships. Uh, they attacked Constantinople on a number of occasions. Uh, they raided all across the Black Sea and along the rivers. And yet East Roman sources could sometimes call them by their name, uh, Ros, but sometimes also Scythians, and sometimes through a particular subset of Scythians, that is the Tauro Scythians. Uh, this is from the uh, ancient medieval name of the Crimea, which was the Tauric Peninsula. And so in some sources, the Rus are identified as the Scythians of the Tauric Peninsula, in other words, the Scythians of the Crimea, even though they weren't limited to the Crimea, obviously, but that was the nearest contact point uh, bet you know, between their world and Constantinople. So this relationship between these two worlds evolved in very interesting ways, especially as the Varangian Rus uh, gradually became Slavicized um, as they uh, inter intermingled culturally and politically with their own Slavic subjects, which is probably the majority in the areas where they settled, but also eventually their conversion to Christianity and Orthodoxy, all the while they're keeping very close contacts with Western Europe, possibly closer in many uh, important ways than with Constantinople and the East Roman world. So this is a very complicated set of cultural processes uh, that it's very important that we not study them teleologically, uh, that is, as leading to the relationship uh, that we imagine today between Byzantium and Russia. Uh, those are much, much later abstractions in the Western imagination. If we go back to the sources for those periods, and we're talking about mostly well, early you know, ninth, but especially 10th centuries when those early contacts were formed, they look very, very different uh, from the much, much later relationships that were premised on, on orthodoxy or experience of um, you know, the Western aggression and crusades or Mongol aggression and so forth. So when we look at those early contacts on their own terms without projecting later concerns back onto them, they reveal a very different world oriented around a distinctive set of dynamics. My guest today is the ideal person to discuss these. Uh, Monica White uh, is a professor at the University of Nottingham in the UK and has written extensively on both parts of the, uh, this equation, both Byzantium and the early Rus. And she has turned recently to an examination or re-examination of their contacts during uh, the uh, early and later Middle Ages, and she's kind of alternating between the two. We decided for this episode to focus on the earlier part of that history, the, the first contacts, as it were, and the different shapes that they took, and she's published some very interesting studies um, of that in preparation, I hope, for a larger um, study that will set this all out um, for uh, experts and general audiences alike. Monica has done excellent work on for example, the cult of the military saints between Byzantium and early Rus uh, on uh, Byzantine contacts with the Viking world more generally, Scandinavia, as well as on the limits of what state policy could accomplish uh, in the steppe. You know, did Constantinople have a policy uh, with regard to the world north of the Black Sea, and what could it do, and what were its limitations? We had a lot of fun uh, talking about this, and I hope you have fun listening to us. Again, thanks to Medievalist.net for reposting these episodes. And hey, I have to mention, I, I think that the number of downloads for um, the episodes of the podcast have jumped recently from about uh, 3,000 immediate downloads to about 4,000 immediate downloads per episode, and the numbers go up after that depending on no, I don't know whether a podcast episode is uh, a sign for a class, which sometimes happens. Uh, anyway, I just thought I'd mention that. It, it's not due to me. Uh, I'm not <laughs> advertising these on social media and such. But, uh, you know, uh, thank you for listening if uh, you're out there now. <laughs>
Uh, all right, uh, here's my conversation with Monica White. Hello, Monica. Welcome to the podcast. Hello. Thank you for having me. This is going to be fun. So let's set the stage for some possible non-experts in our audience. Can you briefly explain the distinction between Rus and Russia? And so why do historians use these different terms and what different worlds do they point to? Sure. Um, I think it won't come as a surprise to your listeners that modern place names don't map onto medieval the medieval world um rare or they map rarely if ever mm. and eastern europe is no exception um and so the place names that we have now russia ukraine belarus primarily is what i'm thinking about have nothing to do with what was going on in the early medieval period um so the term rus um is the name of the political entity that occupied a big slice of Eastern Europe, uh, kind of what's now Western Russia, a lot of Ukraine and Eastern Belarus and ending north of the Black Sea and starting up near the Baltic Sea uh, up in the north. So that political entity um, is in some ways an ancestor, cultural and political, um, religious ancestor of Russia, Ukraine, and Belarus, and in some ways not. Uh, but like any medieval state that no longer exists, you know, it, it, it's its own country. It's not the same as modern place names. So uh, that's why it's good to use the correct name when you're talking about that place. Um, and it's sometimes helpful to distinguish Muscovy as well, um, which in the northeast of that section of that part of the world came after Rus, but before the Russian Empire. Yeah, it, it, just a, a tiny note in medieval Greek, that name appears um, as Ros uh, with an omega. Uh, so Rus, we call it in, in English and other languages, but um, to someone in Constantinople, these people would be Eros. Correct. Um, and another major association that I at least I'm interested in pushing back against has to do with precisely this association between this association between um, Byzantium and like Imperial Russia, um, which uh, I think it becomes much more prominent in like Western European thought in the 19th century and the 20th century. So when Russian imperialism was began to be seen as a kind of threat in the in the Eastern question and great powers politics, politics and also then in the um, in the 20th century with the Soviet Union, um, you you start seeing many more of these sort of genealogies, you know, the mm -hmm. Byzantine theocracy and totalitarianism lead to Tsarism in the Soviet Union, these kinds of things. Mm -hmm. and I, I don't see much evidence for that kind of thinking before uh, you know, 1800 or so, at any rate. Um, and I think it's important for both of these cultures in the medieval period, that we kind of not see them as some kind of foreordained sort of genealogical, you know, pathway, but mm. that we look at each one in, in its own context that, you know, its own environment, lots of different influences and so on. So can you talk briefly about the many kind of confluences and surrounding influences that produced the world of early Rus? Yeah, um, I guess I would say that it's not necessarily wrong to see connections between Byzantium and Muscovy and then Muscovy and Imperial Russia. I mean, the Muscovite leaders were aware of Byzantium and then after the end of Byzantium, they, they knew a bit of that history. And, and in some ways they modeled certain rituals on Byzantine mm. traditions. It is pretty superficial. I mean, I don't, know how much that influence had on you know daily life in in rulership in Muscovy but they they held it up as an ideal but then a lot of places did I mean Byzantium lived on in the cultural memory of a lot of places so um mm. I don't I don't think Muscovy has an exclusive claim to that but Rus um was 
in also influenced by Byzantium, but also completely distinct from it. Um, you know, it had no, uh, unlike the South Slavs, it never had any political um, domination by Byzantium. Um, so it had cultural and economic connections, but um, it had a lot of other very important influences. Um, there were, I guess what you could call indigenous peoples living um, in Eastern Europe, Slavs, uh, Finno-Ugric people, uh, Baltic people, Turkic people. Um, and into that very diverse area came Eastern Vikings, um, starting in maybe the eighth century. Um, and they kind of began to bring trade routes through the area and set up rudimentary political structures. Um, there were also Turkic tribes neighboring Rus, uh, the Khazars, the Bulgars, uh, later the Pechenegs and the Kumans, who had a lot of influence on what went on in Rus as well. So, um, and of course, there were connections with Western Europe uh, or Cap you know, Latin Christendom, I guess you could call it, um, as well. So, so Rus was central to, you know, Christian Europe on the West and kind of pagan and Muslim Eurasia on, in the East, Byzantium in the South, and the Vikings in between. Yeah. Um, and the connections with Scandinavia. Um, presumably the I'm using Viking here in a term that many Viking scholars would not like, but mm -hmm. um, the sort of Viking trade routes, um, you know, through Scandinavia and into probably, you know, Baltic, North Atlantic and so forth. Um, and in your article, uh, Nexus of Empires, you use coins to illustrate all of these different cultural influences that the Rus were absorbing as their kind of polities sort of coalesced. Mm -hmm. uh, can you tell us a little bit about those coins and and what do you see on them? And and by the way, what what were they using coins for? Okay. Uh, well, first, maybe I should explain to anyone who who isn't aware that Rus can refer to a place as well as a people. In case that wasn't clear from what I said before, so Rus the place is that big slice of Eastern Europe. Rus the people um, are basically Eastern Vikings um, who were coming into Eastern Europe and then making their way down to Byzantium and Arabia. Um, so, so I'll use the term in both senses. Um, right, by the time they, they got around to minting coins um, in the late 10th, early 11th century, and this was the time of mass conversion to Christianity, and hence a lot of even stronger influences from Byzantium. They converted to Eastern Rite Christianity, um, which had been going on for quite some time, but there was a bit of a watershed moment in the late 10th century. And the ruler at the time of the main city, Kiev, um, Volodymyr, um, got the idea of minting coins, uh, probably from not just Byzantium, but a number of neighbors. There were a lot of monetary economies in the area and it seemed to be what an up-and-coming ruler should do right. there's no evidence of a monetary economy in Rus, though um i think we can say it was a vanity project it didn't last very long um volodymyr and two of his sons minted the coins but um there aren't very many of them in the archaeological record. I mean, there were some, but they're vastly outnumbered by Arab dirhams. Um, and they don't seem to have had much um, value, well, sort of monetary value. I think they had value as a status symbol. And I use them because they are a fantastic illustration of everything that was going on in Rus. They're some of the only objects that can definitely be dated to the time of Volodymyr, um, who's a really important figure, and, the, you know, objects that were definitely associated with him. Mm. Um, and they show that just so much was going on. So 
he took from Byzantium on one side of his coins, the portrait of the ruler. So him self-portrait there, but not, um, it's a very distinctive portrait. It doesn't look like contemporary Byzantine coins, but it is a full uh, bust portrait on one side. And then, so that seems to be pretty clearly taken from Byzantium. It has his name there in, in written in Cyrillic. Um, but then the coins are, you'll sometimes read that, you know, they're just a straight imitation of Byzantine coins. That's not the case at all. Um, but there's a lot of details there that are really different. So one of the prominent features is something called the tamga, which is a symbol, a little bit like a family crest. It's a bident or trident. And I think listeners might be much more familiar with this now than they would have been a few years ago because it appears on um, sort of Ukrainian, modern Ukrainian, um, some flags or other symbols of Ukraine. Um, it's often called the trident now instead of the tamga. But that was a, a Turkic uh, way of identifying clans and people and it was used by the, the neighbors of the Rus called the Khazars, who were an empire in the North Caucasus. And the Rus had been intermittently involved with them for a number of generations and seemed to have just adopted this imagery from the Khazars or possibly another Turkic tribe. Um, this Tamga symbolism is widespread across the Turkic world. So it's probably the Khazars because they were close by, mm. but it could have been someone else. And then another thing I looked at was the use of silver in the coins uh, rather than gold. So there were some gold coins, but silver was the primary one. Um, neither metal is found in Rus. So for both types of coins, they had to melt down other things. And in fact, the purity is very low. So they're not valuable as precious metal, right. but they were going to a lot of effort to make fake or almost fake silver. Um, and I believe that's because they were trying to imitate the Arabic dirham coins, um, which by the late 10th century were drying up a bit, but had been in the past extremely attractive. And that, was one of the big attractions for the Rus going all the way from Scandinavia, all the way through Eastern Europe, across the Black Sea and into Arabia, was really to get their hands on these dirham coins. Um, and the, the silver in the dirham coins was very pure. And that was a huge uh, attractive feature that inspired them to make that really dangerous and long journey. So when Volodymyr was trying to make his own status symbol coin, silver was much more the go-to metal than gold, although he did do some gold and um, there were some Byzantine gold coins in circulation as well. But there were influences from all over that are really clear in these coins. Right, because the monetary economy that's emanating out of Constantinople at uh, this time is primarily gold and mm -hmm. bronze, much less so silver. But the Arabic one was much more silver, um, as had been the Persian one before it. Um, and it, I always get the sense that Volodymyr is someone who is like accessorizing, <laughs> right? It's like I, I'm a proper king now. What, what do I need? And you know, you, you you know, you get some consultants or advisors or whatever, mm -hmm. some firm that helps you know newbie kings you know establish themselves. Ah, oh, well, you need you need some coins and. Prestige you know, bride helps a lot. <laughs> yeah, you know, convert your people to something. And but it doesn't yeah. really matter what. Find something. And... Build a few churches. Um, and so it's, it's very interesting about um, these groups that don't have primarily monetary economies, like you mentioned, but which do want to have coins uh, for various reasons. And of course... Yeah, I mean, even, you know, the Huns and the Avars and so on had been paid by Constantinople vast sums, mm -hmm. which they don't seem to have used as cash, but rather as sort of prestige items and you make necklaces and you hand them to your followers and, you know, bags mm -hmm. or whatever. Um, 
So when I think about the early Rus economies, I primarily think kind of Viking raiding and trading. Um, mm -hmm. and we know that Constantinople experienced the raiding side of it uh, a, a few times. So can you tell us about these Rus attacks on Constantinople? I, in classes, I just call them Viking raids so that students can understand that Western and Eastern Europe are kind of going through the same thing at this time. Uh, so what did they hope to accomplish uh, when they raided Constantinople? Um, yeah, I call them Viking raids too. I think that is fine, um, especially for undergraduates. And I think it helps to bring it into a, a similar world that people might be more familiar with in Western Europe of opportunistic raids. Um, and there's a lot in common between what happened in Constantinople and what happened, you know, in England and Ireland. Um, so they were very sudden violent, opportunistic, and then they would often just go away again. Uh, sometimes they hung around for a while. Sometimes they would just go away. There was, of course, you're reading the sources from the people being attacked and they don't understand what's going on at all. And it doesn't look like previous engagements that, you know, with the Arabs or with other enemies who had standing armies and bases of operations. So the roofs would just appear out of nowhere, lay waste, and then be on their way. Um, and it, it's not really hard to understand why they were doing it. Constantinople was the richest city in the Western world at that time. It was immensely attractive. Um, the Rus, the Vikings were not looking to conquer Constantinople, but just, you know, get rich quick and get as many prestige items as possible and take them back to hand out to their followers. Um, So they were out for what they could get and have some adventure along the way. And there were the earliest raid that there's any kind of good source for is actually on Amastris on the Black Sea coast in 840, in, in the 840s. But the first known raid on Constantinople was 860. And then they happened possibly in the 910s, definitely 941, and then in a slightly different situation in the Balkans in 971. Um, and that it wasn't the end of the raiding. So it went on from the mid ninth century almost to the mid 11th century. And it was not all the time, it wasn't happening every year, Mm. Mm. Right. but every decade or two, yeah. Yes, and one of the differences, of course, well, the first one on Constantinople in eight. Uh, 60 was quite a shock. The emperor wasn't even there. There were no defenses. You know, it was, it was pretty chaotic. Um, after that, they seem to, um, you know, realize that this is a, a con contingency that they needed to be prepared for. And, and they used the flamethrowers and the Greek fire which is very effectively. Um, and this is a major difference, I think, between what was happening in the West, where they almost conquered England, um, you know, parts of France, uh, I mean, Normandy comes out of this process, essentially. Um, then that never happened, um, you know, south of the Black Sea, um, in part because I think the defenses of Constantinople. Definitely. Yeah. And then, of course, the, the emperor's next move is always to like, we need to hire some of these people. <laughs> And also, I mean, it's important to keep in mind the Rus were not always, but often more focused on the Arab world than on Byzantium. And they they wanted that silver and they knew that they, there was some silver to be had or other precious metal in Byzantium, but they were also always very keen to get through to Arabia, to Baghdad. And there there are some sources that talk about the Rus trading in Baghdad, and they also raided around the Caspian Sea. So Constantinople wasn't their only goal, and they, they weren't looking to conquer. I think they realized that they couldn't manage such a complex civilization um, with the strong walls, <laughs> not just in Constantinople, but other cities. So, so they were, they had a lot of interests in a very wide area. Yeah. yeah, and I think that the they attack churches because I think that's where a lot of the silver was. Because, yeah, I mean, 
for like an expensive dedication to a church, you would sometimes put an icon, you know, framed in silver or something or, uh, you know, an implement or something like that. And I think it was more common to find silver in churches than in circulation as coin. Um, and and that might be why they were targeting them. You know, actually, Hagia Sophia had something like 40,000 pounds of silver in the like altar where, you know, in the Kiborium, whatever. Oh, yeah. Um, so they would okay. have taken all of it if they had gotten into it. Yes. yes. <laughs> um, at the same time, we have evidence for Rus traders who are coming to Constantinople um, in an actually very well regulated way. Um, and so we have these treaties from the early 10th century that talk about um, all the rules governing um, their presence. Could you tell us what their experience was like and what were they trading, but also how, what were the rules about how they could enter the city? Oh, yeah. Um, it's a funny one because the raids were so spectacular and the sources are really juicy and they get a lot of attention for rightly so. I mean, they made a big impression at the time, but it's easy to forget that while these very destructive raids were going on, there was also sometimes probably the same people involved in very peaceful and regulated trade. And I think there's a scholarly tendency to look for reasons or, you know, did this trade lead to that treaty and what was going on? And I'm not sure there's any clear cut connection. I think the Byzantines were trying to manage these people. There was trading to be done. They were happy to do that. And the earliest surviving treaty is dated 9-11, but I think there's good enough evidence that some kind of regulation existed by the 840s because we have the um, Arab writer Ibn Khurdadbe who says that the Rus were um, coming to Baghdad but also coming to Constantinople to trade. And I doubt very much that they would have been let in mm. you know, with fur and swords. They were apparently trading in swords without some kind of agreement or regulation, right. uh, maybe not as well worked out as the one from 9-11. But I think this very early contact was already regulated in some way. So um, so the Rus, then we know there's, there's great textual sources from uh, throughout the 10th century that describe the Rus coming to Constantinople um, they seem to have had a pretty good experience um, if they survived the journey. Right. <laughs> so the, the journey was fraught with peril. It was very long. Um, it took weeks and it, they had to negotiate on the Dnipro River uh, seven sets of rapids famously described by Constantine Porphyrogenitus. And not just the rapids, so they had to portage around the rapids, but that was actually less dangerous than the Pechenegs the steppe tribe who would often attack them, take their stuff, take their slaves. Um, so if they they were constantly negotiating the rapids on the one hand and the Pechenegs on the other. So if they survived all of that um, and made it to Constantinople, they could expect free food, free baths, uh, unlimited, and tax-free trade um, and accommodation uh, in the St. Mama's quarter. And the thinking is that given these perks, there were probably not masses and masses of them. I mean, right. they talk about entering the city unarmed and in groups of 50. So maybe a couple of hundred, but given the tax breaks, I, I can't imagine the Byzantines would have been willing to give that away for thousands and thousands of people. But yeah. um, but they had really good benefits. And I think it's very likely that a lot of them might have then taken an option to join the armed forces in Byzantium and serve the emperor, um, because that's another form of interaction that certainly became more prominent this time. So um, high risks, but potentially high rewards. Yes. And I've thought of this as a, it's a, it would be wonderful, not so much for a movie, but a theme park ride. 
Um, <laughs> well, it's already been immortalized in the show Vikings on Netflix. Yes, yes. <laughs> so yeah. um, the ride from almost up by uh, the city of Novgorod um, near the Baltic Sea, um, there's a couple of episodes of that show that should... I thought it was, I mean, it's completely overdone and exaggerated, but I did enjoy the visualization of that journey from the icebound river up up in the far north and then negotiating all the portages and then eventually coming into the Black Sea. Um, so, we, but yeah, a log flume <laughs> is yes, probably pretty accurate. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you're riding a log down the rapids. With hundreds of slaves to look after and all of your goods and not yes. letting anything sink. So. Yes, and Pechenegs jumping out at you from behind and the bushes. Pechenegs firing arrows at you left and right. Yes. <laughs> and then you reach Constantinople and there's some free food. It's just... And unlimited baths. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I mean, what more could a Viking ask for? Yes, I wonder if Constantinople is trying to tell them something. <laughs> <laughs> anyway but they did have to leave they couldn't stay over winter that was also yeah. part of the agreement that they had to check their weapons at the door at the gates basically yeah. and then they could come in and they could trade for the summer but then they had to go back and they they did not have the privilege of overwintering yes and in the 1040 1044 1043 um attack mm. um Skalitsi says that the authorities in Constantinople rounded up all the Rus merchants who were in the city mm. as a you know potential kind of fifth column or whatever, uh, which indicates to me that they were still keeping track and keeping records of who was where and could you know arrest them and keep them um, you know in confinement during the well a few days of the of the of the attack. Um, so, talk, speaking about. Like on a, on a more kind of diplomatic level, um, you know, we all know that Constantinople's diplomacy is sort of very famous and subtle and, you know, you know, intricate and sort of state on a state to state level. But one of its great weaknesses was dealing with like these decentralized groups that weren't under any central control. So how did Constantinople even try to engage with this problem? Like there's this far north, you don't know much about it. And just these raiding groups come out of it at just random intervals. So what could the the palace do about that? It's a really interesting question. And I think one of the problems in historiography is that this history has been written by Rus specialists like myself, who of course think that Rus is the center of the world and assume that there was some kind of Byzantine strategy um, and of course, because Rus is so important, the Byzantines must have been focusing on it. Mm. My argument is that this is probably not the case, um, yeah. especially the, in the earlier, so in the ninth and then into the early 10th century. And then it began to change at the end of the reign of Leo VI. But um, I think in the ninth century, Byzantium really had its hands full between the Bulgarians on the north and then the Arabs in the southeast mm. and they just did not have the bandwidth to even if they could have conceptualized and and wanted to deal with the Rus in whatever form they did not have the spare capacity and it's not it's not like they could send troops to the Rus bases in yeah. you know what's now Ukraine and Russia they did not go that far north they just it was out of the question um and so I think they just had to deal with whatever came their way and make the best of it and hence all the trading and what I found interesting looking re re-looking at all of these sources is that none of the emperors tried to avenge the raids um mm -hmm or punish the Rus. And, and there's no evidence that the Rus were sort of, okay, you're excluded from trade for 10 years because of that terrible raid. No, quite the opposite. They seem to have redoubled their efforts, said, okay, you know, we're going to sign a new treaty, come back. Um, everything, you know, all is forgiven. I think they just, 
thought that, you know, if we can entice some of these groups and they, they, you're right, they were not all under one leader. They were quite anarchic, like Vikings elsewhere. You know, there might be small groups here and other groups there who were not following the same agenda. And the Byzantines just thought, well, the more we can kind of bring into the fold and maybe tempt with trade and a few trinkets and some baths, <laughs> the better chance we have of forestalling some raids. And I think that was basically the policy until um, the, well, the second decade of the 10th century. Yeah, I get the sense in some of the older scholarship that these ideas of a grand strategy are kind of projected onto the early phases where yeah, and I think any time that see quote you know Russia or whatever come up or the, even the geographical and you're in that space, I think Western scholars are just primed to think grand strategy. How do you contain the problem, et cetera, et cetera, and 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 so you have the, these very elaborate reconstructions of you know the stepped foreign policy of the mm -hmm. you know Constantinople. Mm -hmm. I, don't, I I agree with you. I I don't think that at first this was even a thing. You could at best hope to get them invested in in the trade networks, um, you know, and possibly also in orthodoxy and and hope to move yeah. some groups to be more favorable. And that might shift the balance um, up in the north, which eventually it did. But it took a very, very long time. Um, so could you tell us a little bit about these conversions to orthodoxy? Uh, because. We have, you know, scattered notices that they were happening, you know, long before Volodymyr's sort of more formal, you know, conversion in, in, in you know, in the 980s and after. Um, so in what context did these tend to occur? It's a really good question. And um, one, uh, my observation is that it goes back as far as we have any evidence about the Rus. So again, the lovely Ibn Khurdabe, he only wrote a few lines about the Rus, but they contain so much. He talks about them trading in Constantinople. And then he says that when they get to Baghdad, they pretend to be Christians to pay a lower rate of tax. Now, I think this contains multitudes. I mean, it, <laughs> um, it shows that they knew about Christianity and were probably not actually Christians, but could possibly pass a test or whatever questions might have been asked. Um, and that they knew enough about uh, Arab customs that they, they knew how to kind of get around the tax requirements. Um, so they were all over the place and they were really playing the game of monotheism to their own advantage. Um, and I think it's not impossible. Some of them really had converted at that point. So this was the 840s. Um, we don't have any firm evidence for that, but I mean, why, why wouldn't it have been the case right. really? Um, and then, so Photius who wrote the patriarch who wrote the eyewitness account of the attack in 860 claims to have sent a bishop, um, to Rus at their request, so to their homeland. So it's the first known instance of a Byzantine pers well, person and his entourage going to Rus at their invitation. And he wrote about that in an encyclical letter to other Eastern patriarchs. And there's been a lot of skepticism about that claim for reasons I don't understand. Um, I think because people are so focused on mm -hmm. the later rulers, that we have Slavonic-based evidence that they converted to Christianity, and they want that to be the first mm -hmm. instance. And so for some reason, we I don't think it's so much the case anymore, but earlier scholarship would say, well, Photius was just exaggerating, and no, he made up lots of stories. And But I don't know why he would, because he was writing to people in the Middle East who had no interest in any of this, and was, I don't know, um, I don't know why, what the incentive would have been to make it up. So I think it's quite likely that Bishop went, whether he had any success, I have no idea. But later Byzantine writers uh, talk about the conversion of Rus at that time. And that, you know, is consistent up until the Paleologan period, that his writers of it, in the rare cases that they take an interest in this, which is not all the time, but if they do write about the Rus, they say, oh yes, and they accepted 
Christian, I sometimes they say under Basil the first, sometimes under Michael the mm. third. Um, but it's pretty consistent, you know, mid to late ninth century. Um, and then after that, those growing, the evidence starts to accelerate for Christianity. Yeah. I think those claims in the older scholarship were driven in part, exactly as you say, there's like such a, a massive investment in the narrative of a king, you know, royal conversions mm. uh, on the one hand. But on the other hand, there's a bit of a misunderstanding about what these sources are claiming really when they say, oh, we converted the Rus. And in part, it's so I think that. So Christian discourse here adopted a kind of modality that you see from imperial discourse, namely uh, when emperors had, you know, the triumphal titles like Gothicus and whatever, you know, that kind of thing doesn't mean you conquered all of the Goths. It means that yeah. your armies at some point defeated some Goths somewhere. That's all that means. Like I beat a bunch of Goths. That, it could have been a very small group. It doesn't matter. And a bar brawl. <laughs> and so Christian sources it's tended in, in when they had their sort of triumphalist moments and Focius is writing in that vein. It's like anytime you convert a group, no, no mm. matter how small you can cast that as I converted the whatever at all. So God, it doesn't, it doesn't mean, and nor is Focius claiming that, that they did so with all of them. No. It's just a group and it counts because it adds to the kind of ethnic diversity of Christian conversion, which is such a powerful theme, you know, from apostolic times onward. It's like yeah, this group, and we got some in that group, and we got some in that group. Um, I think that's all they're claiming. But, but anyway. But I think one of the key things here, though, is that supposedly this bishop went there. It wasn't, the, yeah. well, the roots came to Constantinople and requested a bishop. Um, and then he went off to the roots. And yeah, I agree. Very unlikely that vast numbers of them were converted. But um there was suddenly an imperial presence yeah. at that early yeah. phase. Yeah, I mean, the even the imagery that they used to describe this, like another gem in the crown of the faith or something like that. You know, mm -hmm. it could be a small one for now. Um, now, you've also emphasized the importance of mercenary service in the context of this relationship. Can you tell us a little bit about... So this is before the famous Varangian Guard. So these yeah. are Rus that are serving um, in the East Roman armies. Uh, tell us a little bit about their experiences. Yes, um, I think that the mercenary experience is actually one of the key watershed moments um, in the history of byzantine Rus relations. And the earliest evidence we have for that is uh, the campaign to reconquer Crete in 911. That was an unsuccessful campaign, but there's a vast amount of documentation of it, which is great. And it talks about a really large group of Rus uh, serving on that campaign. And uh, keen listeners might remember that this is also the date of the first treaty and with between Byzantium and Rus, um, uh, uh, which mostly focuses on trade. Um, but that treaty also mentions mercenary service, although it's a smaller, it takes up less, a lot less space than the trade, but it, it talks about any Rus who want to enter the emperor's service can do so. And it, it doesn't mention the campaign to Crete. In fact, it, it's very general. It says anyone at any time can enter the emperor's service and you know serve as long as he wants. And um, I think it's not unrelated to the campaign in Crete. You know, this was happening at the same time. And then um, as we go through the 10th century, there's just more and more references, um, not just in Byzantine sources, but in Arab sources about the Rus serving in the army and Navy. So they were serving on um, campaigns in Sicily, Crete, um, but also manning border outposts uh, mm -hmm. on the Arab frontier. And the Arabic writers mention them on a number of occasions. I think they stood out and they made a big impression. And so I think they actually became pretty central to Byzantine uh, military strategy from the first, well, beginning of the second decade of the uh, 10th century. Um, and I think this is what changed the Byzantines outlook on them, that they went from being this obscure kind of, 
very poorly understood tribe on the very fringes of the known world to, oh, yes, we can use these people. Yeah. Yeah. It's a standard recurring pattern in in, in the history of the Roman army. Um, so what, and something similar happened, for example, in the um, like the well, fifth century, fifth and sixth centuries AD, when when you have them when they're starting to hire Huns, for example, for certain kinds of cavalry tactics that the Roman army didn't do that well. So you kind of hire some Huns to do it. I mean, so it's a marginal advantage that you need in certain contexts. And I think, you know, before they hired the Varangian Guard, which was like one of the, the single largest unit that was on sort of full-time professionals um, after Basel II uh, in the Roman army, they were probably, you know, hiring these smaller groups and finding them useful in some context, probably because they could do both land and naval warfare. They probably had a distinctive fighting style that complemented what the other units did. And eventually they kind of went all in on. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, and in a way that aimed to preserve their distinctiveness like the Varangian guard were never like fully assimilated to the you know they wanted them to be like no you do that thing that um yeah, one of the descriptions of one of the naval campaigns mentions that the Rus had their own ships which mm -hmm. I think is really interesting that they probably had their own officers up to a certain level and then they were on their own ships and that obviously yeah. gave them an advantage or they wouldn't have been allowed to do it yeah, yeah, yeah. Tell us about the Ingers. <laughs> okay, the Ingers. Um, the Ingers, this is an observation made by Cyril Mango, um, and he was studying uh, iconoclasm and noticed these two men uh, from the mid middle decades of the ninth century called Inger, which is a name that otherwise never occurs in Greek, um, certainly not before then, but it's a Hellenization of um, Ingvar, the Old Norse name. And, but these two men were very high placed. So one of them was a metropolitan of Nicaea and the other was the father of the famous Eudokia Ingerina who, <laughs> had a, an illustrious career first as the mistress of Michael III, then as the wife of Basil I, and the mother of Leo VI. Um, and this is, so his, this is a rare case where the, the daughter is much better known than her father, but um, she's known often by her patronymic Ingerina. And so based on his daughter's career, it seems that Inger was active in the mid ninth century. And uh, later historians talk about his noble lineage and his prudence and, you know, he, he, his daughter married into the imperial family, so he must have been very highly placed. Um, and we don't know anything more about these men, but they must have been, had some Scandinavian connection, whether they themselves came from Scandinavia, maybe their parents immigrated, but then they, they were very, um, successful immigrants, you know, they, yes converted to Christianity, um, got very high up in society, were written about by leading <laughs> historians. Um, and that is a possible indication of these friendly relations that the Byzantines were encouraging with a small handful of the Rus or you know other groups from Scandinavia, possibly. Yes, and a bishop of Nicaea is not that is a very prominent and prestigious position. Mm. And so for these men to have reached that level in Roman society, it's possible that we're talking about like the second or third generation mm -hmm. um, of immigrants, which takes us sometimes, you know, it's possible it could be eighth century or late eighth century. Um, yeah. So these are contacts that are even prior to a lot of the stories that uh, we've been talking about. Uh, but I remember that article by Mango. It's from the 60s or something. I don't know, but it was really striking. Yeah. Because I, I remember this one phrase where he says, yes, so Evzokia must have been a, you know, a blonde beauty from the north. <laughs> right? Yeah, like the vivacious life of the court. Yeah, yeah. Be something to do with... Yes, when 
you know, other imperial, you know, girlfriends had names like coal eyes at the time, you know, <laughs> and like, no, this is a, she's, she's, she's anyway. Okay. Um, so just to finish up this conversation, is there something that you, so are, are there any kind of general misunderstandings about the world of early Rus, um, that you would like to clear up here, or is there something, some takeaway lesson that you would like the audience to to leave with about this world? Because obviously, it's been so much less studied than its Western counterpart. So you know, like what Vikings are doing in like England is like one of the most overstudied uh, yes. questions. <laughs> um, so yeah, this is just your uh, final thoughts. Well, I would love it if people paid more attention to Bruce at all, um, and then we could clear up misunderstandings later. It, it is rather neglected in Western scholarship. Um, I think um, the main misapprehension about it is that it's some kind of proto-Russia and um, people who maybe know something about later Muscovy and Russia often back project this onto a much, much earlier period. Um, and assume a lot of things about the government of Rus or the um, the society of Rus um, based on <laughs> early modern and modern things that were happening in Russia, yeah. um, which is very much not the case. And um, Rus is a very different place, um, had very different institutions, different government. Um, and, you know, it's also not modern Ukraine, um, although I think there's less of a problem there. Um, and I think both, you know, Russia and Ukraine relate to Rus the way a lot of modern countries relate to medieval precursors. Um, there, there, there's some problematic issues there. Um, but in the Western world, I would just love it if Rus got a bit more attention. Um, one of the things that's so distinctive about it is the extent to which it's a frontier society. Mm. It is a very new kingdom. Like it didn't have any Roman infrastructure the way, you know, the Anglo-Saxons kind of nicked lots of old bits of Roman stuff mm. that happened over a lot of Europe. Um, but Rus, um, it was a very well connected place, but it was also wide open and it really has that feeling of a frontier with a lot of wild animals still around <laughs> um, kind of lots of open space and people just founding new cities all over the place. And it was growing very quickly um, and it was open to all these influences from all over. So um, it um, can really be studied from such a cross-cultural perspective. Yeah, I get the impression of a place that is vast, um, where, you know, people sometimes cluster into sort of proto cities like behind wooden walls, um, but they engage in these very, very long distance, both trading and raiding. Um, they're, you know, harassed by the occasional Pechenegs or, you know, Kumans or whatever. And it takes a very, very long time to establish like, durable institutions you know of governance and things like that it, it does happen but it, it takes a very long time and it, it does have that kind of wild west uh feeling uh sometimes yeah um so are you writing something to, to put all this together you want to tell us what your next project is going to be my project is a history of byzantine Rus relations over the entire medieval period um and i've done most of the early part um so the way i'm dividing it up is I'm, I'm trying to i'm looking for new ways to divide this up and what i came up with was the period of raids is the first part so it goes from you know 800 to 1043 the last roofs mm -hmm. raid on constantinople because for me it was the raiding that really defined the early period and Christianity kind of came in at that, but it it was still uh, very negotiable up until, yeah, well into the 11th mm -hmm. century. And uh, for me, what changed after 1043 was that for various reasons, the Rus stopped raiding Constantinople, kind of settled down, had a more settled diplomatic relationship. And then 
once the church became better established, there was lots of church business going on. Um, so I've I've done a lot of work also on the very late the Paleolog period. So um, mm. after the Rus had the Mongol invasion, and then of course the Latin Empire um, changed a lot of things for for both Rus and Byzantium. So I've written about the late Byzantine views of Rus and how they related um, and thought about Rus, which turned out to be quite a lot in the late in the sort of the yeah. 14th early 15th century. So right now I'm working on the middle bit um, and I'm working on pilgrimage, which got going mm. pretty early, kind of early in the 11th century um, and was very intensive um, and other other types of church business was going on. And then I'm going to look at have that chapter and then a chapter on diplomacy for the middle centuries. Excellent. I very much look forward to that, Monica. And when it uh, comes out, we can talk about uh, we can talk about that focusing on uh, the later period. That would be that would be fun. Yeah, um, those are those are fun writings about those because they're all completely wrong. <laughs> <laughs> With yes, the I, intellectuals, they were really interested in Bruce, but they got most of their facts completely wrong. But that makes it fun to read. <laughs> I so I, I read the articles that you sent me, and I found it in, in, impressive that even in the 14th century. The ignorance in Constantinople about what the North looked like was, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, we'll get to that. Anyway, yes. anyway, Monica, thank you so much for coming on. I look forward to doing it again. Oh, well, thanks for inviting me. It was a real pleasure. All right, take care.